Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Welcome to our 11th RATS webinar. Uh, today we have um, API 610 discussion. This is on our 12th edition changes. Um, there's a few things that I want to go through, first of all, uh, while we've got people rolling in still. Um, so I'm not going to introduce RATS again, but I just wanted to make mention here of uh, an event that we typically do every other year. So this will be scheduled in 2022. There's a date down at the bottom there to be determined. So we haven't figured that, that out exactly, but most likely that'll probably be the last week of October, maybe the Wednesday, Thursday. And so uh, for, the, for those of you who don't know what it is, we started in 2014 and we skipped 2020, uh, but in essence, it's a free technical conference we put on uh, with some one-hour presentations, trade show, um, and then also a day of workshops as well. So uh, it's been great having a, an event like this up in Edmonton. Uh, this covers all turbo machinery and pumps as well. And I'd like to say it does complement the Calgary Pump Symposium, which happens on the opposite year. Uh, other than that, then, you know, Houston would have uh, something similar as well or a lot bigger, obviously, but uh, we tried to do something locally here. Um, so anyways, that's uh, that's enough for uh, for this, but there is some uh, contact information here if you're interested in uh, presenting conference at rotatingspecialist.org. Uh, if you wanted to uh, look at exhibiting uh, trade show at rotatingspecialist.org. Sorry, that uh, slide slipped on me there. And then workshops, um, you know, if if somebody in your organization uh, was wanted to volunteer to do put on a half day training session, then we uh, have opportunities for that uh, workshops at rotating specialist, rotating specialist org. So I'll hand it over to Jared and I'll go back to the introduction slide. Perfect. <clears throat> Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. So as Andrew mentioned, uh, couple things going on and if you've tuned into the previous ones um, the golf tournament uh, it's got to be pushed out from 2021 unfortunately until next year but stay tuned because um, there's a lot of pent-up demand for that one and sure to be a good time as always um, next April um, keep your eyes on the rats calendar for these presentations we got some great presenters coming up RMS power turbines will be in April 15th slot um, Sydney Gross, who is the tech director of Turbine Solutions, covering the topic of power turbines, the aging workhorses. So it's um, going to be everything about uh, the differences from a gas turbine. It provides a brief introduction to the application of power turbines, materials of construction, uh, and life limits, and covering overhaul, inspections, repairs, along with life extension strategies. So I know there's a few of those turbines out there. Um, in the different facilities, so be sure to tune in. And following up in May, there'll be a topic surrounding uh, VFDs, so that's sure to be of interest as well. Um, for June, it's still to be determined, so just to reiterate, um, contact us at the email that Andrew's dropped in the chat there. Um, uh, if you have any interest in being a future technical presenter, uh, if you're interested in presenting at the MRO, submitting white papers, uh, or even being a RAT sponsor in the future and, and curious what it's all about, get in touch with us, shoot us an email. We're happy to, to chat about it. Um, so without further ado, thanks again uh, for the Cellrose team today, putting on today's highly attended uh, presentation. And of course, welcome everyone uh, who is tuning in today across Alberta, Canada, and we've been expanding across the globe. So there's clearly a lot of interest in this ABI 610 update and, uh, with some of the RATS presentations in general. So we hope to make it very interesting and informative. We, we're looking to get back in person as soon as everyone else is, as soon as it's safe to do so for some good network, get good networking, story sharing. Um, and in the meantime, we'll, uh, we'll do our best with the presentations. Um, so all the audience mics are muted. Um, and though your cameras, they may appear off, we can actually see all you guys. Just kidding, they're actually all off, so no worries if you got your pajamas on still. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please do um, 
use the chat function or raise your hand and we can unmute you so that you can ask the question yourself or type it in the box and we'll be sure to bring it up. There'll be a poll question, I think at least one that we've got throughout. So just simply click on that for your answer and get a little bit of engagement going on that respect. Um, I don't think we have any PDFs, but of course um, we will be providing the presenters contact info. So any questions, concerns um, about the updates, you know, they're the guys to talk to, feel free to shoot them, uh, shoot them a note. Uh, please do remember all these videos are recorded and accessible on the GoToMeeting page in which a link for this presentation and all other previous GoTo presentations are stored in the archive for your demand on-demand viewing pleasure. So with that said, I'll hand it over to Ralph. You can uh, give our presenter bios and uh, go from there. Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Jared. Um, I'll, I'll just say for I have great personal interest in, in this topic and, and uh, being uh, involved with pumps for a large part of my career, I'm very pleased that we able to have a couple of speakers that can talk to us about the changes to the um, uh, 12th edition. This one's, as, as they're probably going to say, been a long time in coming. The uh, 11th edition was put out in September 2010. So uh, it's, it's taken uh, quite a while and, and a lot of effort from a lot of people to put together the, um, the 12th edition. And uh, we have uh, from, from uh, Celeros uh, a couple of, of speakers. I'll first introduce um, Jeff Ortega. And uh, he's uh, with Clyde Union Pumps Aftermarket Engineering Manager, North America. Just with, been with Clyde Union for seven years, primarily in aftermarket upgrades and technical services. Jeff also leads the Reciprocating Pump Design Center for Clyde Union. As well, uh, presenting is uh, Cameron Self. Uh, Cameron uh, was a member or is a member of the API Task Force. He's also a, uh, on the advisory committee for the uh, Houston Pump Symposium. He's Clyde Union's representative as well on the Hydraulics Institute, so quite busy uh, representing Clyde Union on a number of um, uh, industry committees. He's been with Clyde Union for 13 years in aftermarket re-rates and upgrades, uh, front-end applications, applications, live order, hydraulic design support, factory test support, and warranty. So I don't want to take any more time uh, from our speakers. I'll let them um, take it from here. Okay, Cameron, I just uh, gave you the controlling rights. You can share your presentation. Okay, let me bring it up. I think I have the same copy you do. Okay. So maybe what I'll screen? do. I'll just start with the uh, poll question there. I just want to get a sense of, uh, you know, people's familiarity with uh, the API 10 standard. So uh, we'll, we'll just see what you have here. So what is your working knowledge of the API standard 610? Uh, those are just letters and numbers to me. That means nothing to me. Or I know it has to do with safety and quality of pumps, or I have referred to or looked up to specific requirements. I regularly use API 610 in my previous or current job. And I have memorized sections and I identify exceptions in specs. So uh, maybe you're an expert level where you've contributed or at least you have suggestions on what they could do better or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, that's a question. Uh, I, no, I regularly use it. I mean, it's, it's something that we look to when we need change, like anytime we need customer specifications or I have a question, we just go to API 610 as a default. And because we know customer specifications pretty much mirror API 610, so. Okay. Now myself, I mean, I- No, it's- it, it, I used to uh, refer to it quite often in the past. Um, 
but I definitely haven't memorized all the sections, that's for sure. So we've got about 80% of people that have voted. And um, anyways, just for the sake of time, I think I'll just uh, stop the, the polls now and then we'll see the results on the screen and see what people say. Okay. Okay, so can you guys see that at all? There's um, a graph here. So really on everybody on this call, I mean, it seems like when I looked at the registration, uh, quite a few engineers, quite a few technical people, I'm predominantly technical people. So it makes sense. Um, there's some people that, you know, are somewhat familiar and uh, some people that are a little bit more and, uh, you know, majority of people regularly use API 610 in their job. So uh, quite a few familiar people in this. And obviously they're quite interested to see what uh, impacts there are to their job, I guess. And there's about 11% who I guess would be uh, at an expert level. So anyways, that is complete. Um, it's back to your presentation again. So anyways, thank you very much, everybody. I'll put myself off the camera and let Cameron take over. Yeah, so some significant additions and changes are the addition of shaft guards for all pumps. So predominantly OH2s, BB3s, BB2s, um, areas where the coupling area is and the seal area is, they want shaft guards, either metal mesh or woven wire. They don't have to be rigid. Uh, there's a new annex addressing specific uh, or special purpose pumps, which include high energy pumps. Um, if you recall, 11th edition had an energy density limit and that kind of either forced sleeve ball, ball ball, or tilt pad bearings. Um, the new edition is, is kind of relaxing that limit and relying on you know, customer experience or OEM experience, particularly within pipeline applications. Um, the material section has been reduced and improvements made to material designations, including non-metallic work parts, uh, pressure ratings for OH, BB1 and BB2 plates, base plates, uh, changes in terms of the size and how they're manufactured, and then performance test points, the locations along the curve where the test points need to be taken, and areas of vertical pumps and other areas of discussion. Um, currently, a love addition addresses only coupling guards. Inputs received from multiple safety organizations and users pointing out the exposed shaft area. And again, that's where, you know, where your hands might be, um, so to speak, and other areas uh, near the mechanical seal gland are covered. The same requirements that apply to coupling guards, they, they still apply. Woven wire is an acceptable approach. Again, they don't have to be rigid, they don't have to be metal. Um, an opening of a half inch has been specified to allow for portable VOC admission tests and a probe of a quarter inch diameter to measure within 0.39 inches of the pump. New annex special purpose uh, pumps. Again, API 610, 11th edition had a limit uh, of, or an energy density limit whereas 12th edition is removing that. And they're defining high energy pumps as having a head per stage greater than 650 feet and a power per stage of 300 horsepower. The use of terms like high energy have been written in the customer specifications with alternate definitions being no clear consensus on what that entails. An example of a high energy or a special purpose type pump might be a 550 RPM hydrogen and oxygen main fuel pump, Saturn V rocket, or any kind of unspared uh, boiler feed water pump. Um,
The aim of the new annex is to be informative. The annex contains sections for definitions, selection, criteria, design, considerations, materials. The special purpose pumps will be defined and addressed as such through discussion between the customer and the supplier. So as an OEM, as an end user, as a third party, uh, EDM, yeah, th these are all things that would need to be discussed up front in terms of the special purpose pump. Again, these pumps are anticipated to be around 1% of all API pumps built. So it's not really that big of a change, you know, in, in terms of, you know, what we deal with, but, you know, occasionally that 1% is going to come up and all these discussions, these additional requirements, additional data sheets, um, are going to come up. And again, this just references the energy density uh, in the past. API 610 specified that energy density greater than 5.4 times 10 to the 6 required a sleeve to pipe bearing arrangement with pressurized lubrication. Um, industry standards have shown, particularly in pipeline applications, that that really isn't the case. The limiting factor is keeping the speed under the bearing under 59 feet per second. Um, if we can do that, then we can generally get away with sleep ball or ball ball bearings. Materials column will change. Columns one and two will be deleted as cast iron pumps are no longer offered for most services in petroleum processing. Boiling water and processed water will be redefined in terms of temperature elements. The standard staff materials for class S6 and 12 chrome. Columns S1 and S3 will be eliminated as, again, cast iron and iron resist materials are not used much anymore. And I'll remove a note for the pressure differential for non metallic wear parts. And remove CA15 for impeller and a place of CA6 and M due to more common usage and improved castability. And again, all these changes are in line with what the industry is pretty much already doing. So API is just kind of mirroring, mirroring what the industry has already adopted. And yeah, that just reifies that. The definition of the maximum discharge pressure for the purpose of calculating MWP has been modified. And I'll leave you on your own to read that comment in the section. Um, it's reworded to include specific type pumps rather than descriptions. The requirement for OH2s, BB1s, BB2 pumps with an ISO 7501. Flanges have a casing MEWP equivalent to their flanges have been removed. So the flange rating for the pump might not be the MEWP, if, if that makes sense. If you have a 300 pound flange rating, don't necessarily think you have 740 PSI um, pressure rating for the pump. It, it, it needs to be looked at at a pump on pump basis. API 682, which refers to seals, is inserted in a paragraph addressing the seal chamber pressure and temperature rating. And a section added for MEWP for castings for 
HVTRS. The additional conditions listed for specifying radially and split pumps. And this has to do with uh, temperature change. And an additional section was added to address the surface roughness for spiral round gaskets and contact surfaces. Breakout school pieces for pumps with machine and study connections are to be supplied by the purchaser. So as the OEM, sometimes it's common, we get asked to supply school pieces, you know, connection pieces. And our, our pushback has always been, you know, we do flange to flange, just the pump. And it's on the OEM to supply any kind of additional piping, or spool pieces or anything associated with that. Cast iron flanges that are long included. That goes back to the material standard. All flanges are to confirm the pressure ratings and dimensional requirements of ASME B16-5. Previously only finished was B16-5 was required. The standard now specifies a minimum actual OD of the flanges. Vendors that provide non-standard length studs for extra flanges, extra thick flanges. So, you know, we provide general studs, but when you get into these extra thick you know, 600, 900 pound flanges, um, then it's on the vendor to provide uh, those those studs. For C6 construction, 316L piping and fittings are required for process temperatures up to including 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, now API 610 sets hot services at 500 degrees Fahrenheit and above. So when you get into those categories, there's going to be special materials that are not standard. The drain rim uh, dimensions for a flat deck base plate are specified. non grouted base plates are specifically addressed. Um, that's something that has to be taken into consideration during the quote phase between the end user and the customer in terms of uh, the technical on non gravity base plates. There's a paragraph that's been added stating that auxiliary systems are not to block maintenance access to components. So again, within the base plate, this is why one of the reasons why the base plates are getting larger is these auxiliary systems, the seal systems, whether it's a plan 52, a plan, you know, whatever, it, 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 it can't block uh, maintenance access to getting to the coupling, to getting to the seals. And again, this just goes into more of the uh, base plate issues for OH2 pumps, particularly OH2 pumps, but it still applies to OH3s uh, and OH4s. Uh, there's a minimum exposed area on the mounting pad for leveling purposes. Uh, there's no stems underneath the feet of the actual pump. So it's kind of common on tests because we're on a temporary base plate, on a temporary platform will shim the pump, but in the field on the permanent base plate and on the permanent structure, there should be no shims under the pump feet. And that's still common, that, that's a carryover from the other uh, version of API 610. But it's just worth noting because I've seen it a lot in the field or they just shim up the pump and they shouldn't be. They, there's 
there's other problems. <laughs> And section 7.4.10 was added sufficient cross members under the base plate. So this goes into base plate design. Um, and underneath the base plate, there are cross members to provide support. And this just kind of addresses that. It's a clear area for grout holes. In if it is a grouted base plate. And there's a provision for an open deck design. Low temperature base plates are specified in 7.4.15.1. Again, this is LCB. Uh, there's usually uh, material checks like Sharpie tests and uh, low temperature material checks that are associated with these orders. The additional test points, uh, there's now nine total. Previously, there were only four or five. Uh, so the new test points are shown in green and they kind of Help spread the curve out. If you look at the next curve, yeah, there we go. So down on the left, it shows what the actual new test points are. So you have shut off, you have min flow, you have halfway between min flow and the preferred operating region, the start of the preferred operating region, approximately halfway between the preferred operating region. 99 to 95% of rated flow, rated flow to 105%. So they're really narrowing in on that rated flow area. End of the preferred operating region, end of the allowable operating region. Now, both of those eight and nine are typically 120% of EEP, 125% of EEP. So that, that's kind of what defines that when, when people ask, well, what's the end of the curve? Well, it's about 125% of the EEP point. So, I mean, beyond that, that we aren't going to guarantee to meet vibration or any kind of performance issues. I mean, customers are more than welcome to run there. There's millions of them that do. But beyond 125% of the EEP, we're, we're not going to guarantee to meet API 16 vibration. So that's what we consider in the curve. Vertical pumps, um, the TIR pumps or the, the runout requirement for the driver and the shaft and the base plate has increased. This is based on the logic that it's impossible to hold the same tolerance on a smaller motor as a very large motor. The dynamic section has been expanded to describe what a dynamic analysis is required, i.e. FEA or um, any kind of uh, computational analysis by the customer. And it's to include all the components, the driver structure, on either its foundation or support. New notes have been added to explain the extent of detail required for the model's analysis. Guidelines per API 610 and Hydraulic Institute to handle situations when the separation margins cannot be achieved. The separation margins there being between critical speed and actual running speeds or natural frequencies. Twenty year minimum service life has been deleted to eliminate any confusion over for warranty issues. Eleventh um, edition required three years uninterrupted operation, and that's been changed to say that the purchaser must define the period of uninterrupted operation. 
And this goes back to things like bearings, you know, bearing changes, oil changes, seal changes, and the, the pumps kind of need to be serviced. So this, this really goes back to that. In PSH3, the vertically suspended pumps, the datum for the elevation point has changed from the top of the foundation to the impeller suction eye. So for vertical pumps, this is really more of a data sheet issue because when you get inquiries for vertical pumps, not every customer references the MPSHA from the same datum line. Some of them do it from the eye of the first impeller. Some of them do it from the top of the suction line. So it it just kind of cuts out the confusion. And parallel operation, existing requirements are continuously rising head flow curve. So for parallel operation, the pump has to be continuously rising to shut off. And it has to have a minimum of 10% rating from rated flow to shut off. But now they're requiring each pump to have a 3% variance within each other within the preferred operating region. And ideally pumps in parallel should all match. I mean, they, they should be identical because you get into a strong pump, weak pump scenario. And this is really what they're trying to get at here with the 3% variance within the preferred operating region. And that's pretty much what I got. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, Cameron. Okay. So, uh, yeah, there were a few questions here um pertaining to i guess um uh, the shaft guards uh to start off with and so you know we were talking about uh, non-sparking and whatnot um i did send a response back you know through the to the question function but you know just basically referencing the uh 11th edition notes and i don't think there's any changes uh to the 12th edition on that where you know the 12th edition really only talked about um you know covering any other exposed area besides the, the coupling itself where uh kenneth burns had a question about the energy um you know of the of the pump and whether that was any consideration to selection of the material um you know whether aluminum would be possible or whether you know brass should be or sorry bronze uh you know so I don't know if you have any uh, insights on, on the material selections at all for coupling guards for non-sparking conditions, or perhaps Ralph does. Um, I, I would say it's probably gonna be based on OEM experience and manufacturer experience. I mean, if, if you've got a similar install with a similar setup and it's sufficient, um I, I it it's really not something that we specify it, it's often something that gets put into a data sheet or a specification and we just kind of follow suit yeah usually when we get an rfq for a new pump installation they're most of them are aluminum and it's it's stated right there on the data sheet by the time we get it yeah, aluminum's common. Yeah. So uh, cost-wise, that would be uh, better if that'll do the job strength-wise um, for yeah for cost and whatnot. But I guess, like you said, on the data sheet, they have the opportunity. If aluminum is not compatible with their process, then uh, there are some other materials, and there's probably some non-metallics as well that uh, can be. Um, so there's uh, see another question about. Um, the discharge flange or the suction and discharge flange uh, the gasket rating uh so it's kind of a good question i mean are should we be following the oem standard or 
is there's you know API something in the API. I don't remember if I've seen anything about uh, the gasket rating. We typically build all of our pumps to the flange rating. So if it's a 300 pound flange, the pump's going to be rated to at least seven point. You know, the pump is usually rated much higher than the flange rating. So the gasket is as well. Um, until we get into you know 900 pound plus flange rating pumps, then we start getting to the point where the pump may not be rated all the way to the flange rating, but for lower pressure rating pumps, um, they're pretty much predominantly all rated for their land rating, so to speak. Uh, let me jump in here. Um, there's quite a bit of confusion in, in the uh, 11th edition because uh, uh, if, if you've read clause 6.3.6, um, it wasn't clear exactly with the comma break, what, what pumps it was uh, uh, referring to. It said uh, vertically suspended, double casing, internal gear driven, and, and so on. Um, the 12th edition has uh, uh, much better defined what, what pumps are, are included in, in the um, pressure rating requirements by actually listing, you know, that, that, that it applies to um, in particular, Clause A, uh, BB1, and then the, all the vertically suspended pumps, DS1, DS2, DS3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So for, for the, those particular categories, BB1, and then all of the DS pumps, their pressure rating has to be equal to at least um, uh, the ANSI Class 150 or, or uh, uh, metric here, so uh, PN20 of that um, material grade and, and pressure casing. So that one has been cleared up. Yeah. That, that was, uh, that had led to a lot of confusion as well as there was also, you know, whether they would have to meet that minimum 600 pound pressure rating. That, that was not, uh, uh, some people understood, some manufacturers understood that that meant they had to be good to minimum 600 PSI and that's been, uh, removed or cleared up by the by the twelfth edition. Yeah. I okay. Uh, let's see. What is the other? The next yeah. Question? No. That that was something we um. That was something that we kind of struggled with internally for a while leading up to all this. Was do we need to re-rate all of our pumps? We, the flange rating and then api said no you don't you don't need to i mean i on a job by job basis we will but what as an overall general you know sometimes customers prefer 600 pound flanges just because it matches up to their pipeline not because they need the pressure rating right Okay, shall we go on to the next question here? Um, this one pertains to the uh, testing standard. So Andrew Mata had a question about how long each point needs to be held for. How long each point is held? Uh, until flow stabilizes. Um, you typically hold it for maybe about, about Two or three minutes, but once the flow kind of stabilizes and it's not bouncing around, then you take your point and you know you go on the next one. I mean, it, it's not a. There's the difference between a mechanical run test, in which it's like a four-hour run test at the rated point, but when you're doing a performance test, you generally just go through the points, and once flow stabilizes. And it's not bouncing around, you take your point and then you move on to the next one. Okay. So it's really just a qualitative observation. And, uh, you know, if it's not stabilizing, you got to figure out what's causing that. Um, well, it, no, it, 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 it always stabilizes. It may not stabilize where you want, but. It, yeah. yeah, that's a I good mean, point. 
but it's, it's stabilizes. But now a uh, mechanical run test, I think is what he's after. And that's a four hour, uh, does, uh, and, and that's really more for mechanical functionality. That's not really for hydraulic performance. I mean, if you're just gonna run at one point in four hours, really all you're testing is the seals and the bearings and everything else. You're not, I mean, the, the the pump's gonna run where the pump's gonna run. I mean, that's um, it, it. As long as it's running on its HQ curve, you know, then the the four-hour duration test is really more of a function of mechanical uh, setup. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I I should mention too. Um, I see Frank Karkowski is on the line here too. He was uh, watching. So he was actually one of the um, authors of the uh, 2016 paper that was presented um, at the pump symposium in Houston, uh, in Texas. Hello, Frank. Uh, so yeah, that was something that we- I, 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 I was- Well. Yeah, I was, I, I, I was actually the, um, the advisor on that paper with Frank. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, Frank and I did the 2016 symposium, the APX I610 uh, updates and changes uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, no, Frank's a good guy. I just, uh, I welcomed him to, to, to join in the chat if he wanted to. I just haven't heard back from him at all, but. Anyways, um, but I did want to you know, acknowledge at least that, you know, um, a lot of these uh, updates also were identified as, there as well. Uh, he, yeah, he does mention that the, uh, the paper is available on the, the website from the uh, Houston Turbo Symposium. We, we also, Andrew, we had it posted yeah. on the RATS page as well for easy access for anyone interested in taking a peek at yeah, it. That was was the monitor for Frank? Go, go figure. <laughs> okay. I mean, you talk about years of experience, uh, and I, I learn more from him. Okay, so um, there's another question here about uh, shims under the pump feet, and so you know, were there any changes on on that? And uh, I don't remember anything uh, in the changes at all. No, shims under the pump are not allowed. They, I mean, they're, I say not allowed, shouldn't be used. Not to say the industry doesn't use them, but depending on hot services, depending on other services, um, they can be problematic. It, you're, you're kind of putting together, uh, you know, bubble gum and, and duct tape when you start putting shims under a pump. Okay. But uh, I guess the standard does allow for shims. I mean, there are some uh, standards as far as thicknesses. Mm, no. not, that I'm, not that I'm aware of. Shims under the pump? Not that I'm aware of. No. Yeah, shims you should always shim the driver. Yeah, there's some requirements on what's what the base plate is required to be designed for in terms of minimum shim thickness under the driver. Uh, I'm kind of coming through it right now, but I'm fairly just to see if something changes. But um, yeah, maybe this is all just for yeah, the driver itself. No, Sims, Sims under the pump. Even going back to the 11th edition, that wasn't been allowed. So I mean, that's I mean, it's not to yeah. say it's not a common practice. It's just <clears throat> not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, yeah, it's it's definitely out there, right? But if you um, on twelfth edition, uh, it's now seven point four point nine. I don't know what it is in eleventh because I don't have it pulled up at the moment. But it's um, unless otherwise specified, pump shall be mounted directly on mounting pads. Shim shall not be used under the pump. So it's a expressly, yes. so to say. And uh, shall is a is a very aggressive word in API. That's that, that means it's not an option. Right. Right. Correct. That's yes. one of the reasons why it took so long to get to committee was words like shall and stuff like that. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, the eleventh edition is seven point three point six. Shim shall not be used under the pump. Period. So it's definitely, definitely there. Maybe they should make that bold. Um, yeah. So it's quite <laughs> I'll, I'll just chime in here. Sorry. That, that, that's that's uh, that. I'm 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 part of that group of that other. <laughs> in that, <laughs> I, I've uh, regularly specified shims under the pump feet. Uh, alignments to be accomplished by moving the driver, but but the the idea of the shims is. Um, if if uh, years later uh, you need to be able to let's say drop the pump a little bit because of the, the piping's shifted that way, that is possible to put in a um, uh, a different shim underneath the pump without having to machine the uh, the pump. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, after after a certain amount of service life, I mean, the pump gets machined, the feet get machined, nothing really fits anymore. So, I mean, it's day one you got the pump but day 15 years later the pump's been machined who knows how many times so it might be necessary to put ships underneath the pump i'm not saying people don't do it, it it's not necessary it, it it is a common practice i'm just saying within api 610 in the context of what we're talking about yeah um they don't allow for it yeah, yeah. And customer specifications can override 610 with them, of course, having to consider the consequences. Right. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm, honestly, day, day one, we ship a pump. It's yours. <laughs> you can do with it what you want. You can bounce it down the street. I don't care. <laughs> but, you know, um that i mean that we're just talking the context of api 610 and and uh you know yeah so i see there's one more question about the uh guards again about the i guess it's more of a statement than a question from uh, uh i sorry i think it's jamie baker but uh anyways you know that the aluminum guards really you know are not going to be able to I take the 200 pounds of force without deforming. So I don't know if there's been any uh, thought to that with the use of aluminum. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, again, that's going to be something that's associated with the specifications, the customer requirements. I mean, we're obviously going to use the cheapest, quickest option, but if the customer has um, a spec specification and they want a specific you know aluminum rigid guard then obviously we'll, we'll go with that i think it's probably one of those things that uh once you do have you know a shot a coupling you know flying apart and maybe going through the the guarding then maybe there'll be some requirements for strength or you know thickness of material or, or that sort of thing uh, as a minimum standard yeah, I mean, usually customers have preferences, you know, depending on what they already have installed. Like if they've already got all rigid shuffling guards, then they're going to stick with that. If they don't care, then we're going to provide the quickest, cheapest option. I mean, that's for better or worse to say, but yeah. Yeah, 200 pounds is pretty high. I could probably step. I could probably uh, step on every coupling guard we have, and it'll all it'll all bend. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they they aren't meant to be like a cage. I mean, you, you if if the shit hits the fan, you don't want your hands anywhere near it. I don't care if you got a rigid coupling guard or an aluminum coupling guard or a mesh woven guard. <laughs> You need to jump back about five feet. And I've been there, trust me. <laughs> okay, so there's a few more questions there, guys. Do you, you see those as well, Ralph and Jared? Yep, they're still coming in. Yeah, just uh, clicking through them. Uh, there's a question here about the maximum allowable working pressure. 
and you know matching matching the flange ratings so uh, i was just curious you know if you had any comments on that um you know as far as any particular you know potential confusion to my knowledge that section was removed um it was originally going to be designed to have all pumps uh with mawps that match the flange ratings but i know particularly with an oh2s that section was removed um i'm not sure but i i, I assume with other you know bb2s bb3s as well but um they don't necessarily need to match the flange ratings. They just need to match the customer's working requirements. Okay. Uh, and I guess related to that, uh, there's a question about, you know, is there any potential opportunity to increase the nozzle loads? And I guess, I don't know if, uh, I guess he's talking about just going beyond what the API limits are or whether there's plans to increase the limits. I'm not quite sure what the question is. Um, not at the moment. I mean, for us to do that would require new casing patterns and new new casing designs, which would be a pretty big task. So, um, and a lot of associated costs. Uh, so it. it with an API 610, no. I mean, it, it, at the customer's requirement, yes, but it's going to incur, you know, cost and lead time associations. Yeah, I've seen that before in the past where I think uh, instead of trying to fix the piping issues, they'd rather just try to, you know, put it all in the pump <laughs> to make it take more. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think, you know, proper I, it, it, yeah. design. Oh, yeah. man. Preaching to the choir. Preaching to the choir. <laughs> I um, can't tell you how many times. Yeah. Uh, here's another question about vibration ranges. Um, you know, for going to 120% of, um, of, of BEP, uh, you know, is there any allowance for increased vibration or really we're just trying to you know keep to the same standards requirements i guess well i mean even even per 11th edition uh end of curve is defined as 120 percent of bep so that's not new um and that's where you know the, the vibration limits extend to 125 percent is kind of a new industry standard, particularly out of China and the Middle East. So we just kind of run it out to that far anyway. But 110%, um, 120%, I'm sorry, is um, that, that was an 11th edition carryover. So that, that's not really a change. Okay. Is, is there any kind of a, a time where the manufacturers need to upgrade their pump models to the 12th edition? Or is that up to the manufacturer? Jeff, Cameron, comment on that? Well, as far as time? Yeah. Timeline to implement that? Uh, I, I know we're... Uh, we're in the process of that for various items. Cameron, I don't know if you, you may know more about that than I do at the moment, but um, typically it's you know it's it takes a while to work these into purchase reports from our end users as well, right? So not only did it come out, you know, it was released January 2021 formally. Um, it it takes a while for that to roll into inquiries for us to meet you know inquiries that we would be fulfilling that would need to meet 12th edition as well so, so a, lot, a lot of people you know, a lot of, um, uh, users or epcs default to latest edition um they'll say api 610 latest edition how would you address that um well i mean oh. Predominantly, all of our pumps already conform to latest edition, 
but if it gets on the case by case case scenario, then it would be a one-off type design. But predominantly, all of our pumps already conform to API 610. I mean, they, they, they were all built around 8th edition, which, you know, API 8th edition was the, the, the Primo Cadillac edition of API 610. I mean, some customers still specify they want it built to 8th edition rather than 10th, 12th, or 11th. Okay. Uh, Jeff, you got a So here's a question about the um, removing the minimum duration of uninter uninterrupted operation. Um, so I think you, you did state that somewhere at the beginning of your presentation, right? Where uh, the three year un uninterrupted window has been removed and uh, to be specified by the OEM. Is that correct? Correct, yeah, and that's to allow for things like uh, oil changes in the bearing, bearing removal, seal changes, I mean, just normal maintenance to the pump. I, I, to go three years without doing general maintenance, I mean, you don't go three years of your car without changing the oil, right? So, it, correct. What is, what's your opinion on changing the oil on the fly? Um, when it turns black? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I've actually heard of people uh, not shutting the pump down and doing oil changes like that. <laughs> I, I, they, they're welcome to do what they want. Again, like I said, once, once the pump leaves our factory, you can bounce it down the street. I don't care. <laughs> You can change the oil, you cannot change the oil, you can rotate it, you can put it in upside down. <laughs> yeah. Well, so long as you yeah. change the oil within the recommendation, I guess, in your IOM manual. Uh, yes, we, 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 we do provide an IOM, we provide recommended service uh, maintenance and stuff, and none of it says wait four years to change the oil, so. Yeah. It's like those infomercials where they drain the car, uh, oil from the uh, the car engine and show you how long it can run on their uh, on right. their secret formula secret formula oil additive. Yeah. Well, I think I've long I don't know I mean I've I've been in part of OEMs enough to see you know the the requirements I guess is maybe uh, you know just a cover your butt sort of thing but obviously condition based maintenance is getting to be a, a much bigger thing as opposed to what's traditionally in the manual. Uh, there's, 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 there's an OEM requirement and there's an aftermarket requirement <laughs> and an aftermarket it just has to work. <laughs> OEM they, yeah they want you to do all, they want you to follow all these guidelines all these specifications but in aftermarket it's like well you know Duct tape and bubble gum, we're, we're just going to make this work. Well, I just find sometimes uh, the requirements aren't sometimes practical, I guess. Um, but in, in any case, I mean, it's, you know. No, but they're, they're, they're really just covering their behind, so mm -hmm. to speak, in terms of all the stuff. Whereas in aftermarket, you kind of have to work with the customer and, and figure out what needs to work and how it needs to work. And yeah, it, it's, it's, just, it's just a different dynamic. Okay, so going back to performance tests, um, here's a question about um, the continuing rising stable head for, uh, you know, for shot off tests. So I guess he was just, uh, asking about the water temperature, you know, whether that, um, I guess he's just saying that some customers are, you know, don't understand that the water temperature affects the, the differential head. So I think it's maybe more of a statement than a question. Hey, that's, um, okay. That head is head. It doesn't matter if it's 60 feet of gasoline, 60 feet of water, 60 feet of diesel. 
at his head. So water temperature really doesn't affect that. But the head rise to shut off is really only for parallel operation. And it's a minimum of plus 10% head rise to shut off. And that's really so that you have two parallel operating pumps that you know, aren't operating in kind of a strong pump, weak pump scenario where one pump's operating in a different place than the other one is. But in terms of water temperature and, and density and stuff like that, pump head is head. It, it, it doesn't matter. Um, the temperature or whatever. Head is a unit of energy. It's not a function of uh, necessarily the the fluid or what it's pumping. I mean, 160 feet of diesel is 160 feet of gasoline is 160 feet of water. Uh, Cameron, uh, perhaps the question might be phrased this way: uh, You spent time in a in a test uh, in the test uh, department. In, in the pumping back towards shutoff, the water in the pump can get hot and its specific gravity changes, but you're measuring it with, measuring that uh, differential with pressure gauges. Do you adjust for the um, SG uh, of the water as you test back on, on the curve? And I did work on tests. Yes, yes, I did, because that was always in our favor because as the SG dropped, we got to correct the head factor and we gained a little feedback. Um, the head rise and shut off is always volatile. So it's kind of difficult to quantify certain measurements, particularly between different pumps. Just because if you're using manual gauges or pressure transducers or anything like that. But um, when, the, when we did test larger pumps, and we noticed there was a significant test cha uh, a change in the temperature of the water, um, we would correct for the SG for that. And it's a minor correction, but it, it always worked in our favor because we, we gained a few feet back. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, that might be part of that question. Well, I... We do have a lot more questions still unanswered, but unfortunately, we've uh, actually gone over our time uh, for the hour. So I apologize to the people that need, get, need to get back to work. Um, what we will do, I guess, is uh, we can address these questions on LinkedIn. And there's, you know, a, in the event, there's places to leave comments and have uh, further discussion on the topic. So, uh, anyways, I welcome you, everybody, uh, to send further questions there if if you do have some more and uh you know thank you cameron and jeff again for uh some explanations on the updates um so feel free to uh check us out next month with rms they're going to do something on power turbines um and some old technology has been out there for a long time but still very valid technology so in any case thanks very much everybody yeah. We'll catch our. If you want to send me an uh, email, uh, a link to those questions, um, I can try and like fire off any one liner, like not getting too much explanation, but um, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Uh, thanks so much. Um, Ralph, Jared, I'm not sure if you had any other uh, parting words before I shut off. I'm. I'm stay stay tuned to uh to rats and and uh, i'm sure that there'll be a number of uh maybe we'll bring this up in one of the uh, topics in our mro conference i think it'd be a good one to have uh, uh as a repeat there yep. okay no nope, thanks everyone and yeah i know we had someone asking about the rats um memberships and organizations um it is free to join by all means Shoot, uh, follow us on LinkedIn there and sign up for the newsletter. And like we said, hopefully in the very near future we'll be able to get back together again in, in person and uh, there'll be some good networking stories to tell and presentations to be had. So stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Take care, everybody.